Hello, welcome to your online lecture for the course Pathophysiology 2. Today's lecture covers musculoskeletal disorders. On this slide, you can see a list of the major pathophysiological themes that we will cover in today's lecture. And we're going to start with musculoskeletal injuries, in particular fractures. So you probably could describe what a fracture is, but what many people aren't aware of is that there are many different types of fractures that exist. A fracture is really just a break in the continuity of bone. A break will occur when force is applied to the bone that exceeds the tensile strength or the compressive strength of the bone. In this image, you can see a variety of different types of bone fractures, and the ones that are starred are the ones that you need to be aware of for this course. We'll start here with an open fracture. An open fracture occurs when the skin is broken over the fracture. So the soft tissues in the area naturally are going to be damaged. This is a problem because, as you could imagine, now we have the internal cavities of bone, so where the bone marrow is contained, are exposed to the external environment, which per puts the person at risk of developing an infection. There's a, an infection called osteomyelitis that we will talk about later in today's lecture, and this is inflammation of bone or bone marrow due to infection. There's also then such thing as a closed fracture, and many of the examples that we're looking at next are examples of closed fractures where the skin and soft tissues over the area of the break are not punctured. Next, we'll talk about path pathological fractures. These, as you could probably guess, are caused by some sort of pathology. So for instance, if a female has severe osteoporosis, osteoporosis, we'll learn about later, is where the bone density or the integrity of bone is, is poor, then a simple fall can cause a fracture. So if you have a healthy person with healthy a healthy bone and they had a fall, their body should be able to withstand that fall, especially if you're falling from you know, a standing position, um, falling to the ground, the hips should be able to, to withstand the force and not break. But somebody who's osteoporotic where their bone integrity is not where it should be, then they can have a fracture. And this is, a, it, this is referred to as a pathological fracture because it's related to the disease osteoporosis. Another great example is if somebody has cancer, let's say prostate cancer, and it's not caught in time and it metastasizes and spreads to the bone, then it can really affect the integrity of the bone and weaken it. So we could say that let's say cancer spreads to this area of the bone here, destroys the bone, gives it a lytic appearance, so L-Y-T-I-C, meaning it almost lyses it and breaks it down and destroys it and it becomes very weak and this person could just go for a run and the forces from going for, for a run can end up causing a fracture. Okay, so again, some sort of force that would not normally fracture a bone would fracture the bone when it comes to pathological fractures. Next up is a comminuted fracture. This is when there's a fracture with two or more pieces or segments of bone, so it's sometimes called a segmented fracture. This can be more problematic for overall healing. It can be difficult to repair. Sometimes these affected individuals require multiple surgeries. But the fragment of bone that's left behind, it's possible that it will end up not getting the blood supply that it needs, but we'll talk about blood supply and, and repair shortly. Next type of fracture is called a green stick fracture. A green stick fracture is a break in only the cortex of bone, so it's really, really the outer part. This most commonly occurs in children under the age of 10 because their bones are softer, they have more flexibility. And so when the bone, the bone breaks, it generally just produces this type of fracture instead of fracturing all the way through. Now where it got its name from, green stick fracture, and this will likely help you remember what it is, the fracture looks similar to what would happen when you try to break a small green branch on a tree. And if you try to, if you take one of these branches and you bend it, there's flexibility. And if you keep bending it, then it starts to break just in the outer, the outer areas. And you can compare that to if you took a older branch, a brown twig on the ground, and you tried to break that, it would generally snap. 
Okay, finally, impacted fracture. This occurs when the broken ends of bone are jammed together by the force of the injury. It's really a type of fracture in which one of the broken fragments of bone wedges into another. So this, let's say for example, somebody jumped from a very tall building and landed on their legs, that force could cause impaction where you have jamming of part of the ends of this bone into this bone. And it might look something like, so this, one, that's one part of bone here, and then you have the other part that jams into it, so it becomes a lot more messy for repair. The final point I wanted to make is that we talked about how you can have an open fracture or you can have a closed fracture. You can also have a complete fracture or an incomplete fracture. And just as the name suggests, a complete fracture is when the bone is broken all the way through. So here is an example of a complete fracture, complete fracture, or you can have an incomplete fracture where the bone is, is damaged, but it's still in one piece, such as this example of a green stick fracture. Slide five, six, and seven talk about the healing of fractures. And this was introduced to you on a very basic level in normal anatomy and physiology, but we'll learn a little bit more about it in pathophysiology. Normally when we heal from a fracture, it's due to these inflammatory processes that ultimately lead to regeneration, which is true of any injury in our body when, when damage occurs and then the body tries to heal. But what we need to happen with fractured bone is we need old bone to be broken down and reabsorbed and we need new bone to be laid down. And we'll look at that on the next slide. But what's also important is that the bones are aligned in order for the appropriate healing to occur. So we'll look here at this x-ray on the left, this x-ray of a hand, and here is a fracture. This is a, this is called a Bennett fracture. So it's a, a fracture of the base of the first meta, metacarpal. This type of fracture, fairly common, will be seen when somebody, maybe they're riding a bike and they fall off the bike and they land with their thumb out and extended. Sometimes this fracture occurs when somebody punches a hard surface, either a person or, or a wall. Some sports, can, sports injuries involve Bennett fractures. But what's important to note here is that this is not aligned. And that's a problem for healing. In order for a bone to heal properly, in order for it to have its normal function afterwards, you need alignment. So this might be something that has to be realigned, for example, with surgery in order to keep it in place. Sometimes certain bones that break require pins to be put in to keep the bone aligned so that it heals properly. And then sometimes afterwards the pins will be removed once the bone has healed. So that alignment is very important. The middle here is showing you a pretty messy, what's called a callus formation following a bone fracture. And we'll talk about callus formations a little bit later. And then this final image here is showing you lack of alignment and how it changes the overall integrity of the bone. This slide shows you bone remodeling. All bone cells participate in remodeling. In the remodeling sequence, there are bone sections that are removed by bone resorbing cells, which you might recall are called osteoclasts. They're the bone breaking cells. And replaced with an, and the bone section is replaced with a new section laid down by bone forming cells, which are osteoblasts. So they're the bone building cells. So we have the breaking down and then the laying down of new bone. And this whole bone remodeling process why is it necessary? Well, it allows our skeleton to respond to mechanical loading. It helps maintain quality control. Um, it, it's involved in repair and, and preventing damage. It also allows for our skeleton to be able to constantly release growth factors and minerals as necessary. And so our body throughout life, even healthy bone, is going to constantly be going through this, this refresh refreshing remodeling phase where we're laying down new healthy bone. Now the cells that are involved I mentioned are osteoclasts and osteoblasts, the main ones. So if we look at the top here, image A, 
it's the osteoclasts that really mediate the or participate in the first phase of remodeling where they're going to scoop out old or damaged bone and resorb it. So that's the osteoclasts. Then the osteoblasts will begin doing their job where they replace, start replacing bone. So you can see the osteoblasts are involved here. And then this yellow structure here is showing you the new bone that's forming. And then in order for the actual completion of this process, it can take anywhere between four and six months before we get this refreshed bone. The right part of this slide is showing you the bone remodeling cycle that just happens in normal bone, again, breaking down old bone and, and laying down new bone, constantly refreshing it. And so you can see it runs in a cycle. And what's important to know is that there are many different signaling factors that are involved in the both resorption and the formation of of new bone and these are are necessary for remodeling and you can see all of those signaling factors listed here and here so you should be aware of these just kidding so that's just an overview of bone remodeling and so now let's look at it when it comes to the bone remodeling process when it comes to a actual fracture of a bone or a break of a bone after the break occurs, damage will be evident to the tissue surrounding the area, including the periosteum. The periosteum is the dense layer of vascular connective tissue that really envelopes the bone, uh, except at the surfaces of joints. But this is important because it's the location of blood vessels. And so you can see that the periosteum here has obviously been disrupted because of the break. And the reason that bleeding occurs is because of damage to this densely vascularized area. Sometimes the bleeding can actually come from the bone marrow, depending on how extensive the break is. And so we have bleeding that occurs, as mentioned, and a hematoma or a clot forms, which really contributes to this next image here, which is this fibrous network that forms. Okay, so this hematoma forms contributing to this fibrous network that prevents further blood loss. Next up, we have the invasion of osteoblasts, those bone building cells, or sometimes depending on how much of the bone is broken and, and how many osteoblasts are required, sometimes the mesenchymal stem cells will actually differentiate into osteoblasts, again, depending on what is needed. Some tissue death also does occur, which will lead to this very strong inflammatory response in order to clean up the area. Now, osteoblasts will begin the formation of what's referred to as a procallus, which is not explicitly stated on this slide. And what's involved here is the deposition of collagen in order to keep the bone together. So it sort of acts like a temporary brace, this procallus. Now, sometimes a procallus will disappear uh, in other cases, it actually can calcify, so the collagen can become bone. And then we get callus, actual callus formation. And a callus is the bony healing tissue that forms around the ends of a broken bone. And depending on how large the callus is, sometimes it can actually be palpated. So for instance, if somebody breaks a bone when they were a child, as an adult, depending on what bone they broke and how easy it is to, to feel it, you might be able to feel the callus still present. And finally, bone remodeling occurs, which we spoke about on the previous slide. Now we'll look at some other types of musculoskeletal injuries. We spent quite a bit of time talking about fractures, but others that exist include joint dislocations and joint subluxations. We'll look at the difference between a strain and a sprain, and we'll define what rhabdomyolysis and myoglobinuria are. We're going to look at this on this slide. So what we'll do here is we will match these conditions with their appropriate definition. And what's interesting to note is that these conditions can occur on their own, but sometimes they can also occur alongside a fracture, depending on the mechanism of injury. Okay, our first example is dislocation. A dislocation is total, or we could say complete, 
and temporary loss of contact between the articular cartilage of one joint to another. This is common in joints such as the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the hip, and the knee. And with a dislocation, because the joint is separating as much as it is, it can really damage soft tissues in the area as well that are not supposed to be stretched and moved in, in that way. Next is a subluxation. A subluxation is a partial loss of contact between articular surfaces of two bones, common in some of the same structures that I mentioned with dislocation, shoulder, elbow, wrist, hip, knee. But the big difference here between the two is total when it comes to dislocation and partial when it comes to subluxation. Next we have strain. A strain is the stretching the tearing of a muscle or a tendon. And strains tend to heal faster than sprains, which are tears or an injury to a ligament. And a lot of that has to do with, with blood supply to the area and more limited when it comes to ligaments. And you may yourself have experienced this. If you've sprained your ankle once, you may have recognize that it always feels like it's a little bit more unstable than the other ankle. Maybe you've had multiple sprains of the same one because it didn't heal completely and it can lead to weakness, excessive joint mobility, and loss of proprioception. Proprioception is very important when it comes to to knowing where our body is in space and so if proprioception is damaged within your ankle because of the damage of ligaments which contribute to proprioception, then your body doesn't necessarily coordinate the placement of your foot. And when you're placing your foot, you might be more likely to roll your ankle. You might be more likely to not respond to stepping into a, a you know, an, an, uh, stepping on an uneven piece of ground, for example. Next up, we have myoglobinuria. This involves the release of myoglobin into the bloodstream due to severe muscle damage. Myoglobin is a red protein that contains heme that carries and stores oxygen within muscle cells. And it's actually very similar structurally to a subunit of, of hemoglobin. But when this gets released into the blood, the problem here is that it will end up being excreted in the urine, but it's very toxic to the renal tubules and can lead to acute renal failure in these instances. And we've, we've looked at this example, a similar example, in when we spoke about urinary disorders. Now, what's rhabdomyolysis? This is the rapid breakdown of muscle that causes the release of its intracellular contents, including myoglobin. So major occurring again with uh, pretty severe muscle damage. Our next topic is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis means porous bone, and it's generally described as decreased bone mineral density. In osteoporosis, old bone is being resorbed faster than new bone is being made causing bones to lose their overall density and become thinner and, as already mentioned, porous. So thinking back to our osteoblasts and our osteoclasts, we should, be, we should be forming new bone at the same rate as we are destroying old bone. But with osteoporosis, you get that imbalance between those, those two remodeling cells, and we'll look at that again shortly. There's an increased risk of fractures because there's alteration in really the bone microarchitecture. Now, bone histology, though, is usually normal, but the overall bone loses its structural integrity. Osteoporosis can progress silently for decades until fractures occur. It is the most common disease that affects bone, but it is not necessarily the consequence of the aging process because some elderly people can retain relatively strong, dense bones. But we'll get into this a little bit more shortly. On this image, you can see what would represent a normal bone and a collapsed bone in somebody with osteoporosis. And this bone is not gonna be able to handle the same amount of stress than this bone would be able to handle. When we look at the bottom here, you can see a comparison between the 
process of osteoporosis or the bone thinning that can occur in both compact bone and spongy bone. And so starting off here is normal. You can see that the first stage really in the progress towards osteoporosis is called osteopenia. Osteopenia is a condition in which bone mineral density is lower than normal, but a person that is osteopenic is not osteoporotic. Some, some doctors actually consider osteopenia to be really a precursor to osteoporosis, but it's important to note that not every person diagnosed with osteopenia will be diagnosed with osteoporosis. You can think of osteopenia as an early sign that bone is starting to change the structural integrity is, is, is reducing, but if these individuals can identify that they're osteopenic as early as possible, then they can start making healthy changes to prevent the development of osteoporosis. You can also see in these images that the progressive bone loss is more obvious in spongy bone than compact bone, which makes sense because spongy bone possesses the trabeculae that, that can appear to thin out a lot faster with osteoporosis. And if you look up at this top image here, you can see just how porous it becomes compared to normal. Let's have a look at this top left graph here showing you that between the ages of zero and 20, there's bone growth that occurs and that at around age 20, you reach your peak bone mass. It remains relatively level, especially in in individuals that are active and relatively healthy until the age of 50. And this is where bone loss can begin. Now, in the best case scenario, there's going to be some inevitable bone loss, but remaining still within that normal bone matrix density is very important because if you drop off too much and you become osteopenic, then this predisposes somebody to osteoporosis. But hopefully an individual identifies, is able to identify from testing through their doctor if they're osteopenic in order to avoid this drop down to osteoporosis. Looking at this image on the right, this shows you that with age, your bone matrix density does inevitably decrease. And it can decrease where a person does not become osteopenic or osteoporotic. Somebody becomes osteopenic and then osteoporotic or a quick drop into osteoporosis. And so what's interesting is that it really depends on where you start. So if there's a 20 year old that is already osteopenic, it could be maybe there's some other health condition going on that draws calcium from the bones or in those that have that are very thin that aren't carrying around a lot of weight. They don't naturally build as much bone, bone. They don't increase their bone mineral density the same way that somebody who's overweight is that has to carry around the weight. And so this person that starts off as osteopenic can become osteoporotic at really a, a young age. You can see that starting uh, before they're even 50. Then here's the next jump up. Still not a great number to be at because it looks like they could still end up with osteopenia or osteoporosis. But here at the top, really the higher you start, the better off you are. And there's a much less likelihood of entering the stages of osteopenia or osteoporosis. So in other words, being healthy and active and participating in weight bearing exercise in your, in your youth and as an adult is very important. But with the increase in sedentary lifestyles, it's becoming more of an issue. And of course, a well-balanced diet with calcium and vitamin D can, can be helpful as well. So this is an important slide discussing really the pathophysiology of osteoporosis. And even though there's a lot of information on here, there's only a few key points you need to be aware of. First of all, this is showing you the alteration in what's referred to as the OPG rankle rank system. Osteoporosis develops when the remodeling cycle, which we know is bone resorption and bone formation, is disrupted leading to an imbalance in this process and sometimes called the coupling process. So it's the coupling of your osteoclasts and your osteoblasts working together because you need to make sure that you are you have this balance between bone that is being resorbed and bone that is being built and laid down. 
And you can see a star here, two stars here beside estradiol. Estradiols or estrogens are very important in modulating the activity of osteoclasts. Estrogens, and this is very important for you to make note of, estrogens decrease the activity of osteoclasts. But after menopause, estrogen levels start to drop off quite extensively. And so then the activity of osteoclasts pick up because again, estrogens decrease the activity of osteoclasts. So if they are not present in the same quantities, then osteoclast activity will pick up, creating this imbalance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And so more bone ends up being broken down than bone that is being built. You can see that there are many other variables as well that can contribute to the this imbalance in the coupling system, but what you need to be aware of for this course is just the estrogens or the estradiols. Hip fractures are quite common in those that have osteoporosis, especially severe osteoporosis, and a common location for a fracture is of the femur. People call it a hip but really what's being fractured, so here's your hip joint here. The common area of fracture is actually the neck of the femur, so the joint itself is not fractured. And this can happen from a fall that otherwise would not pose a problem. And the neck handles much of the weight of the body on that side, and so someone who suffers from this type of fracture will not be able to bear weight. And sometimes, and this probably makes sense if you look at this injury, the blood supply can be cut off and, and compromised. And if blood supply is reduced to the head of the femur, so we'll circle now the head of the femur. So if blood supply is, is cut off or reduced to that area, then the head can undergo necrosis because of ischemia. So it's, it undergoes death due to ischemia. And this is referred to as aseptic necrosis. So the femoral head, when it's not getting its normal blood supply, can suffers from ischemia, then can end up with necrosis. And it's called aseptic necrosis because aseptic refers to uh, free from contamination. So it's not like some sort of pathogenic cause led to the death. In this case, it was just lack of blood supply to the area, not relating to contamination. And so an artificial head may be necessary. Osteomyelitis, I introduced this term to you uh, at the beginning of the lecture. This is inflammation of the bone as well as the bone marrow that's usually caused by some sort of infection and the, infect and the infective infectious agent is usually a bacteria, although other pathogens can be the cause. Bacteria is the primary cause. This is showing you a tibia. Here's the tibia. And so the lower leg, that's the larger of the two bones in the lower leg. And this is a tibia with osteomyelitis. You can see the blackened areas, some kind of reddened areas through here that has suffered from osteomyelitis. On the right, these red circles are encircling this lightened area. And this is an area of lytic bone. I used that term earlier as well, L-Y-T-I-C, lytic bone, where the bone has broken down in that area because of infection. And it can spread, as you can see, has happened through here because within the bone marrow, there's this, this very rich environment. So if bacteria get into, into the bone marrow and infect it, it's a very, very beautiful environment for proliferation and for spread because just for example, there's a lot of iron there. There's a lot of oxygen there. So the question to ask now is how did the bacteria get to the bone to begin with to cause the osteomyelitis? Well, first of all, you should be aware of the two common routes of infection, exogenous or hematogenous. With exogenous, let's say somebody has a wound and the wound gets infected, so the soft tissues in the, area, in the area get infected and it's not treated or maybe it doesn't respond to treatment, the infection can spread to the underlying bone. And so that's the exogenous route of the development of osteomyelitis. With hematogenous, this has to do with 
for example, sepsis, if somebody, or bacteremia, if somebody has bacteria within their bloodstream and it travels to the bone and infects the bone, then osteomyelitis can occur. And then if the infection continues to grow, then it can actually leave the area of the bone or, or spread from the area of the bone to the soft tissues in that area. And so we'll look at the evolution of that in the top image here where you can see a site of infection. And then if we look at the next image, there's blockage of blood supply. There, The infection is, is growing. A, an abscess can form. It's called a subperiosteal abscess because it's just beneath the periosteum. And you can see that it's actually causing growth in that area. So you can see the periosteum is being pushed away from its normal location. And then, then this final image, which would be considered the second stage of osteomyelitis, there are a couple of things to note. One is that if this growth here continues, continues to grow, it can impact the epiphyseal line or the growth plate, which is a problem, a problem in children. And what forms is dead bone. And the dead bone is called a sequestrum. And what you can see also happening is in this expanded area that formed initially during the first stage, new bone will be laid down, and that's called an involucrum. And then here shows you that pus can escape. This infection can escape, and if it does, and it penetrates through that periosteum, then it can spread to soft tissues that are in the area. And this shows you osteomyelitis in bone. I would also like to make note that Staphylococcus aureus is a very common infectious agent with, that can cause osteomyelitis. Infection can also reach the joints and this is referred to as septic arthritis. And there are many different routes that are shown here. So we have the hematogenous route where it reaches the joint through the blood. Bacteria can reach the joint through the blood. Dissemination from osteomyelitis. So let's say somebody has osteomyelitis and it can move and travel into the joint itself. There can be spread from adjacent soft tissue infection. So that's showing you three here. If there's an infection in the soft tissue that's close to the joint, it can cause septic arthritis. Diagnostic or therapeutic measures as well. So if somebody has, for example, arthroscopy done, which is where they're cleaning up the joint, it can introduce bacteria, but this is quite rare because it's usually done in, in a, a very clean environment. And then the fifth one, penetrating damage by puncture or, or cutting. So this would be direct contact with the joint. So there's an injury here, direct access to the joint to allow for infection. Now we're going to talk about disorders of the joints. We'll look at osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis, which are really collectively referred to as arthropathies. And then we will finish this topic by talking about hip dysplasia. Starting with osteoarthritis, sometimes referred to as just OA, it is the most common form of joint disease and the leading cause of disability in middle-aged and older adult populations. Osteoarthritis is really just damage of the bone that results in arthritis. And remember, osteo is bone, arth is referring to joints, and itis is referring to inflammation. It's most common in larger joints, such as the hip, so where the femur then meets with the pelvis. Shown here is damage to that articular cartilage, which allows for nice smooth movement as well as shock absorbing where it and the reduction of, of friction. So individuals with this type of arthritis will often describe it as bone rubbing on bone, which in a lot of ways has some truth to it. Now it starts with some sort of mechanical injury that creates an inflammatory response. Early in the disease, chondrocytes, which are cartilage cells, become damaged. And there's these remodeling errors that occur. So the, when they become damaged, they can't remodel themselves and, and become what they used to be. The articular cartilage is lost through a series of, of events that involve cytokines as well as proteases that destroy the, the jo overall joint integrity, joint structure. <laughs> 
An additional feature includes osteophyte formation. Osteophytes are sometimes called bone spurs. These are produced in most cases of osteoarthritis. And what an osteophyte is, is a bony outgrowth that's associated with degeneration of the cartilage at the joints. And it can cause pain and, and in in themselves, they can be damaging because they're these bony outgrowths that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there. And so this whole process of osteoarthritis, the body cannot repair itself. With osteoarthritis, it's not systemic, so it can affect some joints and not others. You might have an elderly individual that has osteoarthritis in their left knee, but so far their right knee is fine. Osteoarthritis can also result from chronic injury. So if somebody has chronic knee injuries, then even at a young age, they can be predisposed to osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis can result in damage to surrounding structures as well, such as the soft tissues. So for example, it can lead to damage to the muscles, leading to muscle pain. It can lead to damage of the synovial membrane. So the, here's the synovial membrane here, leading to what's referred to as synovitis. Synovial fluid, you might recall, is found within many freely movable joints in our body that aids to allow for, for friction reduction during movement. In this image, you can see the osteophytes, and you could probably imagine how they could cause pain in the area. Look how sharp this one is. And depending on the extent of the damage and also the quality of life of that in, of that person, then they may require replacement. So let's say they have osteoarthritis of the knee, they might require a knee replacement where a new a new and artificial joint is is replace replaces the damaged one. Now we'll move on to rheumatoid arthritis, which although there are some similar features, is very different than osteoarthritis, in that it's this chronic systemic inflammatory autoimmune disease. So some of the key words there were systemic as well as autoimmune. And it primarily affects the joints, but because it's systemic, it can, it can affect other tissues and organs in the body just simply because of its systemic nature. But we're going to be talking about it from a, a joint perspective, of course. And it involves the formation of immune complexes. You've heard that word quite a lot throughout patho 1 and patho 2. And these immune complexes we know can deposit themselves in tissue and cause damage by doing so. And so in this case, they deposit themselves in the joint and, for, and cause damage. And this happens in many joints at the same time, including small joints within the hands. Rather than OA, which we said, although it can occur anywhere, more commonly impacts larger joints. Those with rheumatoid arthritis, which by the way is a type three hypersensitivity, can lead to ulnar drift or ulnar deviation. So remember that the ulna runs on the, if you're in the anatomical position, it runs on the medial portion of your arm. So we've got, it, it would be then in line with your smallest pinky finger. And ulnar drift, you can see it drifts, the hand drifts towards the ulnar side of the forearm. And the reason for that is because the joint cavities within the hands end up filling with inflammatory products and other substances related to this condition. And the presence of inflammatory cytokines will convert the synovium into this really thick, abnormal layer of granulation tissue. And this is referred to as, and I'll highlight it here, a panis. Okay, so again, the panis is created from these inflammatory cytokines that convert the synovium, which runs through here, into this thick abnormal layer of granulation tissue or inflammatory tissue known as a panis. And the panis, as you might be able to envision, really behaves like a locally invasive tumor. You can see it through here. Rheumatoid arthritis we know is an autoimmune disease, but it's an autoimmune disease of a genetically susceptible host that's triggered by some sort of 
unknown antigenic agent. It could be infectious, it could be environmental, who knows. But in any case, it activates or causes the activation of CD4 helper T cells and probably B lymphocytes as well. And here you can see the genetic susceptibility and how it influences the activation of these cells. The local release of Inflammatory cytokines will destroy the joint by ultimately activating osteoclasts, which will break down the bone uh, in areas that it shouldn't. B lymphocytes will also be activated at some point, and remember that B lymphocytes produce antibodies. And so when they're activated, they'll produce antibodies, and these antibodies will form immune complexes that further injure the joint, as we discussed on the previous slide. B lymphocytes will produce rheumatoid factor. This is really important. Sometimes you'll see it written just as RF. Rheumatoid factor is an antibody and it's used for the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and it's found in the plasma. So if somebody has rheumatoid factor within their plasma, it's possible that they might have rheumatoid arthritis. And there's that, I jumped ahead a little bit, but there's the immune complexes, but both those contributing to joint injury. And you can see that the penis formation, as we discussed on the previous slide, joint destruction, there'll also be cartilage fibrosis evident and ankylosis, which is the abnormal stiffening and immobility of a joint. So similar to this previous slide with the hands, you can see how you're not gonna be able to manipulate objects the same way. Our next topic is gout. Gout is an inflammatory response to the excessive quantities of uric acid in the blood and in other body fluids. Remember that excessive uric acid in the blood is referred to as hyperuricemia. Now these abnormal levels will lead to the formation of what's called monosodium urate crystals. And if you aren't sure how to spell that, I'll show you it on the next slide where it's in print. But Monosodium urate crystals will then form within and around joints. So what you end up having is uric acid, too much of it, forms crystals. Really any metabolic disease that leads to an increase in uric acid in the blood can predispose someone to the development of gout. And the big toe is a very common location, um, not necessarily a good reason as to why this is, but uric acid is very sensitive to temperature changes. So at cooler temperatures, uric acid can turn into crystals. So that may be one of the reasons why it can focus, kind of hone in on, on, the, on the foot. This top image shows you gout within the hand and these nodules that can form that can be very painful and of course limit range of motion. And not only can this condition cause pain, but it can be quite destructive as well. Where does uric acid come from? Well, it comes from the metabolism of purines. And purines can come from the food that we consume. They can come from the normal cellular breakdown that occurs within our body. But you can see that the metabolic processes which produce purines will end up producing uric acid. Now the uric acid that's produced, our body is designed to get rid of it through intestinal excretion and through renal excretion, which is a big one. And so if somebody maybe over consumes foods that are high in purines after metabolism, or they just can't get rid of the amount of uric acid within their body, it can lead to a buildup within the blood, hyperuricemia, which can cause the formation, and there's that term I mentioned on the previous slide of monosodium urate crystals or MSU crystals, which can, can deposit themselves in certain areas such as the joints. So it can form these crystals within synovial fluid within the joints that can cause a lot of pain and dysfunction because of tissue damage and continued inflammation. So you don't need to worry about all the variables within here. Now we'll move on to our final topic under joint disorders that's called hip dysplasia or more appropriately referred to as developmental dysplasia of the hip. This is a very important condition in, to consider with children. And when we talk about dysplasia, I don't want you to get confused and think of it in the form of predisposing somebody to cancer. We're talking about it in a different, a different sense. 
And it's very important to identify this in children if it occurs because otherwise they will have a lot of problems with walking and they could suffer constant dislocations of their hip. Developmental dysplasia of the hip is an abnormality in the development of the proximal femur, femur, the acetabulum, or both. So let's identify normal anatomy. Here is would be the proximal femur, so really the head of the femur. Here is part of the pelvis. This is called the acetabulum, and it's these structures that come together to form our hip joint. So somebody with developmental dysplasia of the hip might have an abnormality of the proximal femur, of the acetabulum, or both. But in any case, it's affecting how that overall joint can function. Although this is most common, most often present at birth, it can be, it can occur at any time during the newborn or infant period. So when infants are going for wellness checkups, it's always important to do very quick tests to make sure that the hip is not suffering from hip dysplasia. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But why might a child be born with this? There are many different potential reasons that they might be predisposed to, but one example is if a female that's pregnant has a deficient volume of amniotic fluid, it can limit fetal movement, which is thought to be one potential cause why a child could be born with developmental dysplasia of the hip. This x-ray here is showing you the progression of developmental dysplasia in the hip, and if it's not corrected, as I mentioned, these sufferers will, will have a lot of issues with walking. And there, as I said, you, it can affect the, the head or the acetabulum, but for example, if you have a very shallow acetabulum, then you're not going to be making good continuous contact um, with the proximal head and the acetabulum. And so if we look over here, there are two instances, subluxated or dislocatable and dislocated. Dislocated, I'll start with, means that in these affected individuals, there's no contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum. Okay, so dislocated. Subluxated, there's partial contact, but it is susceptible to dislocation. So that leads me then to talk to you about two very important orthopedic tests that need to be done on newborns and infants to ensure the integrity of their hip. And those tests are referred to as Barlow test and Ortolani's test. And I'll give you just a very brief piece of information on each. And then during our class time, I will show you this so that you can realize how simple it is to perform this test and also how effective it is in providing information. Barlow test, the infant's hip begins reduced, meaning that the hip is in its normal position. But when Barlow's test is done on this hip that's in its normal position, it will dislocate the hip. So in other words, the hip starts reduced and the test will dislocate it. Reduced again, meaning in its normal place. With Ortolani test, the hip is actually dislocated. So in this example here, the hip is dislocated, but when Ortolani, Ortolani's test is done, you can put the hip back into its normal place. So to summarize that, for Ortolani test, the hip starts off dislocated and the test will reduce the hip or put the hip into its normal position. Again, I will show you this to make it much more clear at the start of our next class. And so if this is positive, it might warrant then x-rays of the hip and then treatment at that point to ensure that the hip recovers as best as possible. Our next and final topic is bone tumors. And this is a really big topic, but we're only going to be talking about a few types and concepts. Remember that we have primary or secondary tumors and bone tumors can exist in either form, primary being where it, that it originates within the bone and secondary being that it spread from somewhere else to the bone. And there are a few primary cancers that tend to preferentially spread to the bone and that would be prostate, breast, lung, and kidney cancer. This can lead to pain, of course, pain in the bone, but sometimes the pain gets ignored or thought of as being you know, from something else. But oftentimes when people realize that they have cancer in the bone is because some sort of path, a pathological fracture has occurred. And a good example of this would be, um, you might be too young to remember Jack Layton, who is, or who was, I should say, 
a Canadian politician, leader of the NDP party, and he had a, I think it was a leg fracture, and it ended up being a pathological fracture, and then they found prostate cancer. So prostate cancer then had spread to the bone, and then once the bone broke, then it was identified that he had metastasis. Final comment on the slide to make is uh, just very brief information regarding the seed and soil hypothesis. And this refers to cancer being the seed will preferentially grow and spread in an area if the soil or the environment is right. And that's why certain primary cancers will spread to certain specific organs because it is really the best environment for its growth. So you can think of it as these favorable interactions between metastatic tumor cells, which are the seed, and their organ microenvironment, which is the soil. And sometimes there's a drug called bisphosphonates that are used when people have primary cancers of certain organs in order to prevent bone metastasis. And these bisphosphonates will actually change bone physiology in order to prevent or reduce the odds that the cancer will spread to the bone by making the bone environment not favorable to, to cancer, basically cancer setup and cancer proliferation. There are many types of bone cancer and it depends on which cell it originated from. And the ones that I want to bring your attention to, you do not need to know everything on this slide, but we're going to talk about osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma in this course. Osteosarcoma is the most common malignant cancer from osteoblasts. This is the cancer that Terry Fox had. And Ewing sarcoma is the primary the common primary cancer in children. So I'll highlight osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma discussed on, mentioned on the previous slide and then refer you to this diagram here where you can see that different types of cancers, bone cancer, primary bone cancer, tends to originate in specific locations. And that's important because let's say you have a, an 11 year old child that is having this chronic pain in their mid thigh. Well, first of all, it doesn't really correspond with pain that they would get maybe at the level of the growth plate if they were growing, but they have this pain in the thigh. Maybe you assess their muscles and there's no real tenderness of the muscles. They don't complain of, of you know, extra pain when they're moving around. Night pain can be common where they have this achy pain in their, in their leg that they feel in their bone that can happen at night. And then it's important to consider this type of cancer. Parents can sometimes ignore the signs and symptoms and just relate it to growing pains. Oh, your legs hurt? Okay, well, um, it, it's probably, or your leg hurts, it's probably growing pains. Or it might be disregarded, for example, with osteosarcoma in the knee. Ewing sarcoma tends to occur between the ages of 10 and 20, so knowing that age range is important clinically when it comes to looking at what cancers are most likely, whereas osteosarcoma more common under the age of, of 25. It can be diagnosed via x-ray, where you can clearly see in this case the osteosarcoma that ha you can see this large growth that's starting to destroy the bone, and then you can see it's present here as well, so pretty pretty nasty. If somebody has this type of cancer, so let's say somebody has cancer here, and this is the only location of the cancer. They do scans, it hasn't spread to anywhere else in the body. Sometimes it'll be recommended to amputate because it hasn't spread, and that will, that will prevent it from, um, from metastasizing elsewhere. However, if the cancer has spread, then sometimes for quality of life, the leg is just left because it, it's already spread elsewhere in the body as it is. And then finally, showing you here just at the bottom, uh, nuclear medicine showing a hot spot that is very, very unusual and suspicious. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening.